Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. We are taking one of these quick trips through the, through the Bible. This session will be working in the book of Hosea. Turn to the book of Hosea and read with me starting in verse 2. When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry. What, what kind of God is this? <laughs> what and does have that children mean? of harlotry. Yeah. And children of harlotry. I don't think that's what Why? children. What, what does wow. harlotry mean? This is talking about Go marry a prostitute. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that I understand. Wow. Well, let's, w w in order to understand this, we have to get a little of the historical background. Hosea and three other prophets, and we will be taught, we've already talked about Isaiah, but three other prophets, Amos and Micah, were four prophets who all uh, prophesied about the time, around about the time of the downfall of the northern kingdom of Israel. The time when that kingdom disappeared into history, gobbled up by the Assyrian Empire that was up north of them, and, and disappeared into history. We don't know what happened to them. They, they never came back from, from, well, at least they never as a group they came back. Some of them may have come back when the, the southern peoples of, uh, came back under the, under the uh, help of Cyrus. But as a, as a group, they never came back. They never repopulated their territory at all. So Hosea lived during a time when there was all kinds of intrigue going on. There were kings being murdered. There were kings being, you know, and on and on like this. There was actually six more kings that he doesn't even mention there in verse 1. Um, Zechariah, Shalom, Menahem, Pekahiah, Pekah, and Hosea, uh, all of whom ruled during the last few years I before. I have a question. How many tribes of the 12 tribes lived in this northern kingdom when it was uh, taken over by Assyria and um, dissolved. How many tribes then were missing? Okay, and it depends on how you count them. The, the tribe of Levi was scattered to both north and south, but now at this point in time, because the Levites were not respected in the north, they were connected to the temple services, the majority of the Levites apparently moved to the south. To the southern kingdom. So in the southern kingdom we have the tribe of Judah, and so that's why it's called Judah. The, the tribe of Simeon was a relatively smaller tribe, and they end up living mostly in the tribe of Judah as well. The tribe of Levi have moved now down pretty much to the south, and so basically we have three tribes that ended up more or less in the south, and the other nine were, were in the north. So there was quite a substantial number of yeah. tribes in the north that disappeared then. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So this was a time of tremendous upheaval. And, it, it, and what we're going to try to say, of course the purpose of this fast trip to you is to try to say what does it say about God. So we, we, we need to, and we've already raised the question, you know, he, would, he really, would God really tell somebody to go and marry a prostitute? A prophet of God, a pastor? Well, it's what would you think of your, if, if the pastor had got up in church? Suppose you had a single pastor, and he got up and announced one day in church, God has given me instructions to marry a prostitute. And you would say, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, it doesn't give the formula for choosing the one, though. It doesn't, huh? But here it's, if you read on, it says, for the land, which means the land of God's people, commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. Mm -hmm. 
So is this supposed to be some kind of lived out parable? Yes. Well, it appears mm -hmm. to be, yes. Mm -hmm. It appears to be. Which seems kind of funny, but... Well, has, has things gotten so bad that God is about to have to abandon the northern kingdom? Yeah. In what way was the northern kingdom bad? Well, they, they had essentially abandoned God. They were after every given up on pagan on God they could find. Where's Can we document that from scriptures? Read 2 Kings 17. Look at 2 Kings 17, and let's, this, is, this is the time we're talking about. And I'm, I'm going to read a few verses here just to give you a little feel for what the background is because you can't really understand the book of Hosea unless you know what's going on around here. I'm going to read from 2 Kings 17. I'm going to start, the first five verses are historical. I'm going to start with verse 5. Then Shalmaneser invaded Israel and besieged Samaria. In the third year of the siege, which was the ninth year of the reign of Hosea, uh, this, this is not Hosea that we're talking about, but Hosea the king, the Assyrian emperor captured Samaria, took the Israelites to Assyria as prisoners, and settled some of them in the city of Hala, some near the Habor River in the district of Gozan, and some in the cities of Media. Samaria fell because the Israelites sinned against the Lord their God, who had rescued them from the king of Egypt and had led them out of Egypt. They worshipped other gods, followed the customs of the people whom the Lord had driven out as he, his people advanced, adopted customs introduced by the kings of Israel. The Israelites did not did things that the Lord their God disapproved of. They built pagan places of worship in all their towns, from the smallest village to the largest city, on all the hills and under every shady tree. I mean, my fingers are getting tired here with all the counting up all the things here. On all the hills and under every shady tree, they put up stone pillars and images of the goddess Asherah. They burned incense on all the pagan altars, followed the practice of the people whom the Lord had driven out of the land. They aroused the Lord's anger with all their wicked deeds and disobeyed the Lord's command not to worship idols. So basically, what have we seen here so far? What are they doing that they're supposed to be doing? That's a description of spiritual harlotry. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how does it compare with the people that were driven out ahead of them? They're About the even same. worse, is what <laughs> yeah. it says. If you go back to other passages, it will say they were actually worse. Yeah. Mm. The Lord had sent his messengers and prophets to warn Israel and Judah, abandon your evil ways and obey my commands, which are contained in the law I gave to your, uh, the law I gave you to your ancestors, and which I handed on to you through my servants, the prophets. But they would not obey. They were stubborn like their ancestors who had not trusted in the Lord their God. They refused to obey his instructions. They did not keep the covenant he had made with their ancestors, and they disregarded his warnings. They worshipped worthless idols, and guess what happened? They became like them. They became worthless themselves. And followed, they followed the customs of the surrounding nations, disobeying the Lord's command not to imitate them. They broke all the laws of the Lord their God and made two metal bull calves to worship. They also made an image of the goddess Asherah, worship the stars and serve the god Baal. They sacrificed their sons and daughters as burnt offerings to pagan gods. They consulted mediums and fortune tellers and they devoted themselves completely to doing what is wrong in the Lord's sight and so aroused his anger. The Lord was angry with the Israelites and banished them from his sight, leaving only the kingdom of Judah. We have the presidents that consult the mediums to this day, don't they? Yeah. So why, what? Did, why did they go so far when God had protected them and Not only what protected happens? them, but given very specific instructions about what they were supposed to do and weren't supposed to do. Well, the north and south were rivals with each other. Why did God put up with them for so long mm. doing this? Hoping that they would turn. <laughs> yeah. Well, so now let's go back to the parable, the lived out parable of Hosea. God told Hosea to go and marry a woman of harlotry, uh, as it says, uh, marry a prostitute. Is, that, is it possible that God actually said that? Or, or is this, this is just too much? 
Well, it, it's no worse than Abraham, go kill your son. So it might as well, maybe it is, just like the way it reads. <laughs> no worse than that, huh? <laughs> okay. Well, it might bother you if you if you think that action's a sin, but he's doing what God's telling him what to do. And okay. so... So if God tells me to marry a prostitute, it's okay? Yes, absolutely. Okay. There, yeah. are, there are people in insane asylums <laughs> that say, God told me to kill so-and-so. Well, they're not in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, so how do you? Maybe see, they would have That's been. why. All you got to figure out is a way to get your name in the Bible, and then you're okay, right? Was was Hosea <laughs> was Hosea a known, recognized prophet? Apparently so. His book and got so recognized. He and so he said, "I need. I have to marry a prostitute to show you what you are doing to God." Was it was it Hosea's idea? Or was it God's mm -hmm. idea? God, God told me to marry a prostitute to show you as a demonstration of what you are doing. He didn't Let seem to raise too much of an objection to this. Well, hold on a moment. Hold on a moment. Let's think about it. I just read you a description of the way things were in Israel in Hosea's day. Maybe this was the best woman there was. Maybe so. Oh. No, I think I think there was a pure <laughs> picture here. Uh -huh. This is a pure picture. There is a picture here of contrasts that that needed to be shown here. Contrast between what and what? Well, the right way and the wrong way. Okay. The question is, right now we're we're trying to pick a wife for Hosea. Right. And God is picking him. How many good choices do you think he had? I don't know. Maybe the prostitute was the best thing around. Well, yeah. I'd like it to said, say zero, said, but then there's the thing about Elijah said, it's only me left. And yeah. God said, well, I've got, what, 7,000 others? There were some good, good women in, in the But background. he commanded them to, or told him to marry a harlot. Yeah. I mean, what are you supposed to do? You say, oh, you didn't even have to tell me it should be a harlot because they're all harlots. Where are you going to find one? What? <laughs> How, what process is he going to use to find one? Well, you could find one if you wanted to. I'm pretty sure. Okay. So let's follow the story again carefully. <laughs> well, her so. name was Gomer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Real cheery. Gomer Pyle. Hey, hold on. <laughs> okay. We're not going to hold that against her. It's been a real winner. <laughs> and so what happened? He married this prostitute, and what happened? And she bore him a son. Okay. And what was the son's name? Jezreel. Jezreel. Do we know anything about Jezreel? There was a massacre at Jezreel from the house of uh, Jehu. Mm -hmm. Okay, the current kings of, of, well, some of the current kings of, because there were so many of them, but some of the current kings of, of Israel had massacred the previous uh, dynasty in Jezreel. So we're talking about a place where there's conflict going on, where there's change in government, where new people are coming and taking over the place of the old one. So it may not be immediately obvious to us, but to them, they knew immediately what this, this suggested, okay? And it, which was? That <laughs> we're in a time of tremendous upheaval. Right at least, here. At least that much. The footnotes here says uh, Jezreel meant God will scatter the name's given to the child as a prediction of judgment coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, judgment coming, exactly. Okay, what happened next? Another child. Another mm -hmm. child. In this case, this a time? A daughter. Daughter. A daughter, and what kind of wonderful name did she get? Unloved. Unloved. Can you imagine Mary? The story naming, gets better. <laughs> can you imagine ma naming your daughter unloved? Well, the name was Lorohama. <laughs> yeah, but it means unloved. No okay. mercy. No mercy. Okay. Unloved. That's a pretty rough name to live with for the rest of your life. Yeah, really. Is God telling um, them how to name their children? Well, well probably. Mm -hmm. Look, a That's name is one. a name. I mean, we had a pastor named Loveless. Uh -huh. And he lived with that okay. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's not much different than unloved, as you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Well, then she gave birth to another. Well, hold on a second. Oh. What does it say about the father of unloved? Nothing. Do we know who it was? No. No. Said she had a child. So Gomer had a second. But child. apparently, what is she doing? But we, do it's, we know any more about her than we know about the other one? It just said she conceived and bore him a son. The first one mm -hmm. doesn't say who the father was. But it says bore him there. The yeah, yeah but she bore him. him a son. But here, so his daughter says nothing. Well, he married her, so any son she had was going to be his. So the second well, child was just hers. <laughs> even that's what I'm saying. Even if it didn't look like him, huh? See, the first, the first one says, you know, um, is that like saying bore his son? Is that is, is does the Greek say that? This is the Hebrew. Or the Hebrew say yeah. that? Bore his son? Yeah. And the other one doesn't say that. It doesn't say. Yeah. After the birth of their first son. First child, a son. Yeah. So, so now she has another child which is not his. And what would you say at that point in time if you were the pastor? Uh, we need some counseling. <laughs> we need more than counseling. You'd have some paternity tests. <laughs> Paternities, there weren't any available at that time. Well, back in the day, they would have picked up some stones. Mm -hmm. and That was what was supposed to happen, right? But here, it's all, it's the Wild West, if you will. Every, okay. There's no law. People what are happened no to law all with the God. Rules, what happened to all the rules from Deuteronomy and Numbers and Exodus and Leviticus? It seems like they forsook them. They left them up in the high the places. Lord. They left them up in the high places. Well, let's talk for a moment what was happening in these high places. We sort of ran over it real quickly there in 2 Kings 17. What was happening in the high places? They got the spirit out of the bottle, and they would get very near and dear to their Lord with their prostitution. Okay, the there was a lot of alcohol, and they believed that these gods controlled the fertility of the land. They believed that these gods controlled not only how many well, I don't want to call them children, how many young that the animals would have, how many sheep, how many lambs the sheep would bear and the goats, how many kids they would have and how, cows, how many you know, calves they would bear. And they believed that, also con that, that these gods also controlled how well, the, the, how much rain would come down and how much crops would be born. So if you're a subsistence farmer and your whole life and the lives of your, your, your whole family depend upon the reproductive capacity of your fields and your animals, what do you do? But who told them these ideas that your fertility of your animals depends on this statue? The fertility cult priests, of course. And so they started listening to the fertility cult mm -hmm. priests. That was because they had no priest really speaking up and to guide them, right? Yeah. So there was a void there of yes. the truth being spoken. Yes. And when they started following this trend, uh, what happened? It developed. Yeah. And they, well, and the, the, the heathen priests, what was going on? I mean, I don't, I don't want to get too graphic here, but let me assure you, there was not only female prostitution, there was male prostitution, <coughs> there was every sexual promiscuity kind of thing that you can possibly imagine going on at these places because they believe that the more sexual you were in the worship of these fertility gods, the happier the gods will be and therefore the more blessed you would be in your crops, etc. Now, they didn't burn their children here, did they? Yes, mm -hmm. they did. What did that have to do with fertility, burning? It was a different god. I, mean, I don't know exactly what his role in It always was. fascinates me how people decide to burn someone else rather than themselves. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we, we're starting, I hope we're starting to get a little bit of a picture of what's going on here. Now, and let me just ask you, at that point in time, if you were God, what would you do? Here are these people that are known to be, quote, your followers. And this is what they're doing. Well, I'm not sure I understand how having my prophet go marry one of them helps anything. Well, I haven't got to that part yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, God could sap them and end them all, but he decided to give them a lesson. It's, okay. a, it's a demonstration. 
isn't it? Well, we know historically that they were that close to being scattered to the winds and disappearing as far as God's, they were never again, quote, God's people. Some individuals may have come back later, but it was the end of them as far as they were so that So what close. was this demonstration who, for Hosea to do this? What was, who was he demonstrating to? Well, I mean, that's part of the question. Who is he demonstrating? He's well, the people who were there. The hope is, God's hope was that the nation of Israel would look at this lesson and change. Yeah. That the nation, that Judah would change too. But if he that knew, we would change. But if he knew, had the great foreknowledge to be able to predict thousands of years for, for Daniel, yes. didn't he have the foreknowledge to know that this didn't appear to have much well, but it for, gives them well, a chance. Yeah, very good. That's that's a good point. But let's think about that. If you have a child that's about to destroy himself or herself, do you say, "Well, I know that they're going to destroy themselves, so so be it." Well, Could God be doing this for come on, our now? Men? Be honest. My foreknowledge is not quite as accurate as as God's well, foreknowledge. Well, well, suppose that you had that kind of foreknowledge. What <clears> would you, you do? do? Would you plead with that child? Would you of try to do anything to try to get their attention, to try to do something? At least to get them to understand what they're doing. Yeah. Because I don't think they even understood what they were doing. Well, they, they had come to believe that all this fertility cult stuff, maybe they thought it was fun. I mean, alcohol and sex, I mean, you know, it's great stuff. Go to Las Vegas and you can see. Uh, but could God have done this for our education uh, as much as his people, for people reading this in the future, sh saying God did this, God did this, and, and he was trying to correct these people, and we learn a lot from this. How many well, times had they gone into captivity? Or were, they, they had not gone into captivity yet. Well, then why not try one of those routines? Egypt. They were well, captive, you, yeah, they yeah, were yeah. I suppose you could say Egypt. Egypt. Yeah, but uh, I mean, instead of having Hosea marry a harlot, why not send them into captivity and bring them back again and give them a good lesson, modify their behind? We 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 saw what happened. Uh. We knew we knew what was coming out, <laughs> uh, coming out w with Judah. That's what he that's what he did with Judea. Yeah. How many years did it after help? Egypt was this? This is about uh, seven hundred years. After mm. Egypt, so they completely about. forgot the lesson of the Exodus. Oh yeah, yeah. That was way. So long with, it, with this kind of result here, uh, doesn't doesn't Satan come out to be the the right guy? Well, he's, he might he's be you know he's saying you know look, you know I told you all along these people couldn't couldn't handle this. Yeah. So it might look like that. So the question is, I, you, nobody's answered my question yet, what would you do if you were God? See, that's the question. Before we can comment well, about God, what would you do? It yell looks and like... scream and shout and do anything I could to get the kids' attention. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like God is get not scared to reach in and get his hands dirty. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. To get Hosea... Hosea... Whatever. Does this mean that in the to future to why he, he recommends young pastors to go find prostitutes? Well, it depends on the situation. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> That's an understatement. <laughs> because obviously it happened here. Yeah. I mean, could it happen again? I mean, could God could. make the same illustration come out with somebody else? Could happen again. Mm -hmm. So the question was asked, I think it's Norm, you know, why didn't God find some nation to take them into captivity? Well, the point is that there was, that the Egyptians, um, pardon me, the Assyrians were the only big empire at that time, and they, that's not what they did. They destroyed nations. They scattered them yeah. so that they wouldn't be an, uh, an empire anymore. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if, if they'd been faithful enough to God to wait another 120 years, then the Babylonians would have been been around to take them into captivity and it might happen the same oh. as what happened to Judah. If God wanted these people to go into captivity and come back, that's it exactly what would have happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but yes. the, po the point is, in long terms, was, was Israel any better off than Judah or Judah any better off than Israel? Doesn't look like it. Not that much. Jay, what were you going to comment? Are you... 
I, no, I, I departed from what you were thinking. It doesn't bear repeating. Right it. here <laughs> in, in the Bible it says in the middle of this, but I will have compassion on the house of Judah. Mm -hmm. So God did think differently. Gave him um, another 130 years. The, the southern tribe he was looking more favorably on than this northern party hardy crowd. Yeah, yeah. So is he, is he trying to save the nation here or trying to save what few lives? Is Hosea the only one he's working on here? No, we know that, eight, but, but he's, Hosea is the only prophet from the northern kingdom that we know about that was, that was following God at this point in time. Amos prophesied to the north, but he came from the south and went to the north to prophesy. Mm -hmm. And they told him, get out of here. Yeah. So what does Gomer think when Hosea shows up at the doorstep and said, hey, I think we need to get married? <laughs> well, <laughs> it was security for her, sure, fine. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> why wouldn't a young girl want to marry somebody? It didn't get in the way of her business. Yeah. Well, well what that's not the end of the story. <laughs> and that's not, I mean, obviously, th this is not the reason the book is, th this book is in the Bible. There's got to be something more here. So what, what's going on? What, 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 what are we going to, we haven't finished the yes. story. Let's, let's go on, yeah. I, well, I was just going to say, this is a fabulous book. Hosea is one of the great books of the Bible because it shows us really God's love. Mm -hmm. His people are against him. His people abandon him. His people follow other gods. And he yells and screams and tries to cajole them back into the family. And, uh, you know, we can find out God is a very loving God from mm -hmm. the book of Hosea. Okay, we're going we're gonna to go there in a moment. And if we're sinners, you know, that's good news for us, that we have a loving God who will forgive us. Okay. Well, I don't know. Some might say God just doesn't know when to give up. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's taken him a long time to come. Given his foreknowledge, I'd assume that's a good thing. Yes. I see. Okay. And she conceived again, and it doesn't say mm -hmm. by whom. Mm -hmm. And she named uh, the son mm. Loami or something. Not my people. Mm -hmm. not my For people. you are not my people, and I am not your God. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what else can you say at that point? Remember, if you remember this, I, you know, and I, it would be nice if we all had perfectly sharp memories and we all remembered everything that's happened in the history of Israel so far, because again and again and again, when it, God brought them out of Egypt, what he said, if you do this, you can be my people and I will be your God. If you do this, you can be my people, I will be your God. If you do this, you'll be my people, I can be your God. Again and again and again. And they even said, we will be your people and we will do this and you'll be my, our yep. God. All that the Lord has said, we will do. We've Exodus done 19. We've for 6,000 years and still haven't. Mm -hmm. I mean, if Revelation's correct, why it's yeah. going to end up, what is that poem, not with a bang, but a whimper? Yeah. Yeah. At least... That, that's the way it would kind of appear. So. Okay. So we've got a problem here. We've got God telling what apparently was a prophet, maybe even a pastor of some kind, to marry a prostitute. We've looked and we've seen that the conditions were absolutely awful under the circumstances. Maybe she was even the best woman available. But what is, gonna go, what is God going to make out of this that could possibly be helpful? Stick around, we'll find out.
I hope you've um, got your mind cranked around all this stuff we've been talking about here. This is quite a story. I think you would have to agree to that. And apparently, God intended to be some kind of lived out parable. So what are we going to learn? Well, we need to turn to chapter 4, and we're going to see some very stark comments about how God feels about the whole thing. The Lord has an accusation to bring against the people who live in this land. Listen, Israel, to what he says. There is no faithfulness or love in the land, and the people do not acknowledge me as God. Okay? That's a pretty blunt statement, right? They make promises and break them. They lie, murder, steal, and commit adultery. Crimes increase, and there is one murder after another. And so the land will dry up, and everything that lives on it will die. All the animals and birds and even the fish will die. And how are we supposed to live when all that happens? Remember, we're talking about people who don't go to work every day and receive a paycheck. We're talking about subsistence farmers here. The Lord says, let no one accuse the people or reprimand them. My complaint is against you priests. So who's leading out in all this stuff? The priests. The priests. Night and day you blunder on and the prophets do no better than you. I'm going to destroy Israel, your mother. My people are doomed because they do not acknowledge me. Your, you priests have refused to acknowledge me and have rejected my teaching, and so I reject you and will not acknowledge your sons as my priests. The more you priests there are, the more you sin against me, and so I will turn you, uh, your honor into disgrace. You grow rich from the sins of my people, and so you want them to sin more and more. You will suffer the same punishment as the people. I will punish you and make you pay for the evil you do. You will eat your share of the sacrifices, but still be hungry. You will worship the fertility gods, but still have no children because you have turned away from me to follow other gods. So what happens? Were the priests making money off the people? Oh yeah, of course. You don't think they were doing that just for being nice. They were charging nice. admission and all. Oh. oh sure, of course. And, and they had major, major, major part of the sacrifices that were brought, the, 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 the priests received and consumed, etc. Yeah. Now we're still talking about the north, right? We're still talking about the northern kingdom of. So where of where did they do all this at? Well, I read to you on top of every hill and every city yeah, okay. and even the small villages everywhere were these things. Is that's a real danger when we don't have good leaders? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is this a type of what's going to happen in the end times? You're, you're trying to get ahead of my story here. Aren't Sorry. You? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the Lord says, wine, both old and new, is robbing my people of their senses. Does that sound familiar? They ask for revelations from a piece of wood. <laughs> a stick tells them what they want to know. They have left me like a woman becomes a prostitute. They have given themselves to other gods. So are we starting to see the parallel? I mean, it's spelled out here, isn't it? Were they getting responses from these sticks of wood? Pretended responses, yeah. Maybe it was a Ouija board. Well, it was Maybe it the was priest. Maybe alcohol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At sacred places on the mountaintops they offer sacrifices and on the hills they burn incense under a tall spreading trees because the shade is so pleasant. <laughs> As a result, your daughter serves prostitutes. How many of your daughters? Seems like all of them, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And your daughters-in-law commit adultery. Yet I will not punish them for this, because you yourselves go off with temple prostitutes. And together with them, you offer pagan sacrifices. As the prophet says, a people without sense will be ruined. Even though you people of Israel are unfaithful to me, may Judah not be guilty of the same thing. And of course, what did we find out? We're going to find out that Judah was doing just as bad a things a short time later. Um, don't worship at Gilgal or beth Avon or make promises there in the name of the living Lord. The people of Israel are as stubborn as mules. How can I feed them like lambs in a, in a meadow? The people of Israel, under the spell of idols, let them go their own way. Now, did Hosea write this and read it to the people? Probably. In, in church and in the public square? Probably. Yeah. The people of Israel are stubborn as mules, let them go their own way. Do you think he talked about his marriage relationship with Gomer and said, 
you people are to God like Gomer is to me in his sermons? Is, yeah. You think that was? I think that's what God intended. Yeah. Well, that's not the end of the story. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't finish up with the end of, of uh, it, it, chapter 3. The Lord said to me, Go again and show your love for a woman who is committing adultery with a lover. So we come back to the story. What's happening? He's to go. Where, where is Gomer at this point in time? She's off with lovers. She's in the red light district. Okay? The same woman? The same, his wife. Okay. Okay, and so what is he instructed to do? Go and get her. Go and get her. And how does he do that? He buys her. He, he buys her back. Suffering. Fifteen shekels of silver. Yeah. And about a homer and, and a lethic of barley. Yeah. Which, of course, we don't... Fifteen pieces of silver and seven bushels of barley, if my, my version says, to buy her back. So, what would, you, what would you say if the pastor says, Guess what? I got my wife back. Well, where did you get her from? Well, the red light district. I paid for her. In today's dollars, about $500 plus the barley. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Is that an attempt to sh show that God is willing to buy us back? Mm -hmm. Did she stay this time? Well, we don't know. The story doesn't have an ending. That story mm -hmm. doesn't. We don't have the ending of that story. Put have. it that way. We don't have the, the ending. And so, through much of the rest of the book of Hosea, it talks about God's relationship to these pagan things that were going on and Hosea's warnings about them, the warnings to Judah and warnings to Israel and the people's constant insincere repentance. Look at chapter 6. The people said, let's return to the Lord. And of course, the Lord is Yahweh here. He has hurt us, but he will be sure to heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage our wounds and won't he? In two or three days he will revive us and we will live in his presence. Let us try to know the Lord. He will come to us as surely as the day dawns, as surely as the spring rains fall upon the earth. In other words, these fertility gods, gods are not taking very good care of us. Maybe we need to try Yahweh again, right? But the Lord says, Israel and Judah, what, I'm, what am I going to do with you? Your love for me disappears as quickly as morning mist. It is like dew that vanishes early in the day. That is why I have sent my prophets to you with my message of judgment and destruction. What I want from you is plain and clear. Now, stop right there. What do you say God wants from us? Steadfast love and not sacrifice. You're reading it. There, um, I knew a person who wanted to do something bad, which he did, and another person married to him who said, I don't want to do that. And he says, it's okay. All we do is ask God for forgiveness and he will forgive us. And it sounds like those people, yeah. they know God is merciful. They don't really have a change of heart, but just say, oh God, forgive us. And they think that will do it. Mm -hmm. And God says, all I want is what truth and... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, th it's very interesting that this little, this little uh, verse here in verse 6, Hebrews, I'm sorry, Hosea 6 verse 6 is, is Hebrew poetry. Now, Hebrew poetry is a little different than our poetry. There were matching ideas, rhyming ideas. And look at it. I want your constant love, not your animal sacrifices. That's the first part of it. I would rather have my people know me than burnt offerings to me. Now, the burnt offerings to me, what part would that match with? Not your animal Sacrifice. sacrifices. Not your animal sacrifices. So constant love should match with what? Knowledge, Knowledge. of God. Knowledge of God. What Hosea, what God is saying to us through Hosea, that real love is consistent with knowing God. If we really know God, we will love, we will, we will love Him. Well, Jesus said in John 17 that that was yeah. eternal life. Mm -hmm. There was an God. old song, mm -hmm. to know, know, know me is to love, love, love me. Yeah, he exactly. He just wants a relationship with us. Mm -hmm. Well, and so I want to come to to chapter 11 in this book. There's lots of other things we can talk about, but we need, we need to look at chapter 11. Does it get worse or does it get better? <laughs> well, 
the whole story here is not really of much use unless we know how God responds, right? Unless we know what God has to say about all this. So before you look at chapter 11, how would you say God is going to respond to all of this that's going on? Now we know historically that the people went into captivity and they disappeared. The Assyrians, in order to prevent the possibility that any nation could rise back up and, and reassert itself, they would, when they would conquer a nation like Israel, they would take people and they would send a few here and a few there and a few here and a few there, just scatter them to the wind so there's no chance that enough of them could get together to, to form any kind of uh, opposition to the Assyrians. Well, we got a hint of what he was going to do in 617. Mm -hmm. Ephraim is joined to his idols, let him alone. Yeah. Yeah, 417. 417. Yeah, 417. There are implications here that God is angry with the nation of Israel. Yeah. And what does God do when he's angry? Yeah. Um, many people think that he will burn them, mm -hmm. exactly. kill them, something like that. And almost everybody, Christians included, believe when God deals with the wicked at the end, what will he do? Burn them. Burn them, Burn them forever. If you, if you believe one version of story, even other versions say, well, in any case, God is going to get his pound of flesh no matter. He's got to get it some way, right? Jesus said on the cross, my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? And that well, might Jesus be... Jesus wasn't a sinner, surely. Well, that... Well, he took sin on himself. That yeah. might be us sinners when we, if we face the second death, we would say, my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? Oh, okay. Well, <clears throat> let me, let's look at Hosea 11 and see what we can learn and, and see what implications that might have for us. The Lord says, when Israel was a child, I loved him and called him out of Egypt as my son. Okay, when was, I mean, do we have to guess when that was? What was he talking about here? Red Sea and the Exodus. The plagues and the escape from Egypt and mm -hmm. all of that was involved, right? Mm -hmm. I called him out of Egypt as my son. But the more I called to him, the more he turned away from me. What do you suppose the time period that would be? Just about from then on. Just yeah. about from then on? Well, they did. Maybe specifically the time of Joshua and especially Judges? Yeah. yeah. Very much so, the time there's of all, Judges. There's also the time of the golden calf. Yeah, right there. At the foot of Mount Sinai. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my people sacrifice to Baal, they burn incense to idols. And again, Baal was a fertility cult god. He was associated with Asherah, who was a goddess, fertility cult goddess. Yet I was I who taught Israel to walk. I took my people up in my arms, but they did not acknowledge that I took care of them. Mm -hmm. I drew them to, my, to me with affection and love. I picked them up and held them to my cheek. I bent down to them and fed them. I mean, what's God trying to, to, to say in these verses? Mm -hmm. He took care them of them. And loved mm -hmm. them. Yeah. And, of course, they responded in, in kind, right? No, they were like Gomer. <laughs> and they were like Gomer. So the, the parable fits, huh? Yeah, exactly. They refuse, so he goes on, they refuse to return to me, and so they must return to Egypt, and Assyria will rule them. And that's about what's about ready to happen, right? War will sweep through their cities and break down their gates. It's already happening in Hosea's day. Yeah, it will destroy my people because they do what they themselves think best. Do we ever do what we think is best? Oh, yeah. yeah. They insist on turning away from me. They will cry out because of the yoke that is on them, but no one will lift it from them. Who, is it, who has the capacity to lift the yoke from them? Right. Jesus says, my yoke is light. Mm -hmm. My yoke is easy. My burden is light, right? Yeah. So who's not going to be there to lift the yoke off of them? Jesus. Yeah. But how does God feel about all of this? Look at verse 8 there. How can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did Adma, or treat you as I did Zeboim? What's Adma and Zeboim? Cities around the Dead Sea. And what do we know about... The Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. If you go back to Genesis 10, verse 19. These cities 
were destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. So God is saying what? That he wants to treat people like that? I said, my mm -hmm. heart recoils within me. My mm -hmm. compassion grows warm and tender. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. Mm -hmm. For I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst. Mm -hmm. And I will not come to destroy. Yeah, so what does this tell us about God? Is he happy about the time when the, when the wicked come to an end? No. Not at all. He feels is it possible? And here's what I would like us to think about in, is our conclusion for the book of Hosea. Is it possible that as the wicked perish in the end, as what was happening right here, that God is weeping? Yes. yes. It is. He loves that, them. Well, he loves them. They can't how come can to he heaven. Be burning, how can he be burning them forever in hell if he loves them? He's respecting their choice. He's not burning He's them not in hell burning forever, them forever in hell. Okay. He's not burning them at all. Not burning them at all. How do you know that? They've already died the second death. Okay, we, we need some evidence. Can we find any evidence? Who are the, who are the contemporaries of Hosea? Amos. Isaiah. Isaiah. Isaiah and Amos, Amos and Micah. Okay. Look at Isaiah and see what he says about what will happen to these wicked at the end. At the end. Isaiah 66. It's dead bodies. And the very last verse in the book of Isaiah. Actually, let me start with verse 22 of Isaiah 66. Just as the new heaven, earth and the new heavens will endure by my power, so your descendants and your name will endure. On every Newman festival, on every Sabbath, People of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem, says the Lord. And remembering that Isaiah 65 and 66 is all talking about the new heavens and the new earth. As they leave, they will see the dead bodies of those who have rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will never die, and the fire that burns them will never be put out. The sight of them will be disgusting to all people. Now, We've got problems, a little bit problems of interpretation. Not everybody's going to understand what it means. A worm that eats them will never die and the fire will never be put out. What do those things mean? Well, you know, this book says that the everlasting torment visible to us in heaven will always serve as a reminder of the mm -hmm. terrible consequences of rebellion against God. So when we're in heaven, according to this um, commentary, the person who wrote this, we're supposed to see the burning fire of maybe our friends and, and be reminded that sin is horrible. Mm -hmm. And Those people. that would not be heaven. May I remind you, there are many, and I, don't, I didn't bring them, maybe I should have brought some of them here to conclude with. There are many, many statements by main, mainline famous theologians that said the happiness of the saved will be increased by the fact that they will be able to look out from heaven and seeing the wicked burn, and they'll say, you know, I'm so thankful I'm in here and I'm not out there burning. Does that sound like a God no. of love? Well, there's a lot of people that write commentaries that, that, of, of that way that Joanne read there, and they can't imagine that God would ever have creatures that would do what's right because it's right. Uh -huh. They need a threat of punishment or torture to keep them in line. They need, they need a, a, a promise of reward for good behavior and a threat of punishment for bad behavior. Otherwise, yeah, but that, that's, I, that's really where, where I've heard that expressed by many people because they just can't imagine that a time would ever come in dealing with finite beings that they will do what's right just because it's right. What does it mean by can't put the fire out? Well, and again, we could, if, if we had time, we would go and we would show from, because the, 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 those verses need to be compared with Revelation 14, 9 to 11, where it talks about the third angel's message. And what it's really saying is that nobody's going to put the fire out. It will consume whatever's there to be consumed, but it will go out when it's completely consumed. What's so there. nobody can put it out till its job is done. Right. Furthermore, remember that it says what's being consumed is dead bodies. So there's no torture going on here. These people are dead. Okay. 
And if we go to 2 Peter chapter 3, it says that the fire that comes from God is so hot it melts the elements. What does that tell us? How long would it take for a body to be consumed if the fire is hot, so hot it would melt elements? It'd take a miracle. God would have to perform some kind of miracle to keep them there burning. Yeah. Yeah, he would, very clearly. Malachi 4.1 mm -hmm. says that they will, on that day they will burn up and there will be nothing left of them. Yeah. It will burn like straw. Does and it goes God, on down and says it will be like ashes. But the effects are eternal. The effects are eternal. But, yes, Joanne? Does it say that God will cleanse the earth with a fire in the end? Yes. Well... Everybody who doesn't want to be around, he has to uh, cleanse and completely um, just get rid of so that he the new heaven and the new earth will be um, <clears throat> completely new. But the question here is, what have we learned from the book of Hosea that adds to that story? God is love. God is forgiving. God continually wants to save. And and but you can run away. Yes. He's wishing yeah, that none it should is perish. Say that again? He's wishing that none should perish. Yeah. But all should God doesn't perish. want anyone to perish. And what? Uh, well, I'm just, I, I keep going back to why God would ask this good person <coughs> uh -huh. to go and marry a prostitute. Mm -hmm. is, is Hosea representing Israel? Mm hmm. No, oh, Hosea is representing God. God. Okay, and Gomer is representing Israel. Israel. That's what I meant to say. Yeah. And God chose Israel as his people. Yes. And if you want to get more details, look at Ezekiel 16 and 23. God Why says, would God choose a prostitute as his people? Well... Because that's what they were. Yes, exactly. I think that's because but that was the best thing that was available. Okay. That's exactly what I said about Hosea. Maybe that wife he got was the best one available. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in actual fact, Hosea probably went and chose a wife, the best he could find, and God says, go ahead and marry her, even though she's a prostitute, was probably what actually happened. It doesn't say that he loved her. No. He did what God said to do. Well, there was some passage in there where I think God was in the earlier. It, God told him to love, to his, love her. To love her. Yes, as yes. he loves If you look girl. at the bigger picture of Hosea, you see that there's a lot of love mm -hmm. for Hosea or, or for God, for his people. So here's the ultimate question that we need to come to. When God finally deals with the wicked, what is his attitude? How does he feel when he sees the wicked perish or when he has to destroy? I mean, how did he feel when he, at the time of the flood? How did he feel when the firstborn were being destroyed in Egypt? How did he feel when he was, he was swallowing up Kordath and Abiram? How did he feel when he poured out fire on, on Nadab and Abihu? How did he feel when he poured out fire on, on uh, um, Sodom and Gomorrah? How does God feel about all that? How can I give you up, Ibram? How can I hand you over? My God's heart weeping. recoils. As the tears come down his cheeks. That's what Hosea 11, 8 says that you were just mm -hmm. quoting. Yeah. So is it fair for us to say that this represents God's attitude toward wicked at all times? Of course. Because you know what I'm going to sure. come to next. At what point in history will this reflect, I mean, at what point in, in history will God deal with all the wicked, and what will he be doing at that time? Well, two things. I mean, at the second coming, they all die. At wicked the third, die at the third coming, the, at the third coming, they're permanently destroyed. The wicked. The wicked are. Okay, and how does that happen? Is God zapping them and burning them, or what's yeah. happening? I think they die the same way that Jesus died. He died of a broken heart. And they're going to die because their physiology can't handle the realization of what they have been and what they have missed. You're saying that what God said way back in Genesis 2 verse 17 is still true. Yeah. If you sin, you will die. 
They're not going to want to be in heaven either. They're not going to want to be in heaven because they they, 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 they feel uncomfortable in that kind of a situation. They, they wouldn't mind them. having the city. They wouldn't mind having the city and they would be happy to partake of the tree of life. Sure. Yeah. But God says, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do the great controversy all over again. I'm not going to allow rebellion to start again in heaven. So I can only admit to heaven what kind of people? Ones I can trust. Ones that want to be there. Will he? Those that love like Hosea did. Yeah. yeah. So in, in the beginning, God did not say, if you sin, I'm going to destroy you. No. He says, if you sin, the consequences of that is you're going to die. Yes. And oh, yeah. my people, I don't want you to die, so please don't sin. And then Jesus came to, to forgive our sins so that we could live. Mm -hmm. And when we have Jesus inside us, that helps us to... Um, live that kind of a life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of supposed to. What a mystery. Yeah. Did, did anyone yeah, respond to Hosea? Did, uh, did Gomer uh, kind no, of no. fall in love? Well, see, it leaves that up in the air. It doesn't tell us the final answer. But I hope that as we read this book, we recognize how God responds to the situation of, of wicked people. And, and at the end, it's not if God says, you know, I love these people over here, but boy, you people on this side, I'm going to just zap you, I'm going to burn you, I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do to you. No, God counts everyone righteous and wicked as his children. His most outstanding child of all time was Lucifer, who turned out to be the devil. And I b absolutely believe that Lucifer will form, will, will be an eternal void in, in the mind of God. Because here was his, his, per his perfect child. The one who should have been number one. The covering cherub who should have been the one who's standing next to God's kingdom. And every wicked person who is gone at the end, God will weep over them. He's not torturing them. He's not burning them. He's weeping as they perish. And that's exactly what you would expect from a God who is described as God is love. And he doesn't stop being love. It doesn't say God is love until it's time for him to be something else. God is love forever. See you next week.